Okay, great. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, the Montpelier City Council is uh, in session. I want to go over a few uh, logistics first. Anyone who's appearing or participating remotely, I would appreciate it if you would uh, set your uh, display to your uh, full first and last name so we know who's uh, joining us. Any, and similarly, anyone who wishes to address the council, we would ask you to start by stating your name and where you live for any comments, either uh, as a portion of the meeting, we ask that you keep your comments uh, to under three minutes and we will have assistance in, uh, in keeping track of the time from Ms. Prim. Um, anyone who wishes to speak must uh, wait to be recognized by the chair. And once you're called upon, you may make a statement or ask a question, but we do not expect a back and forth between council and, uh, and speakers. Um, so whatever comments or questions you have, get them all out at once so we could be ready to, uh, to respond to them. Um, anyone who speaks out of term, turn discusses non-germane topics or goes on too long will be uh, reminded to uh, come within conformance of our rules. And with that, our first item is to approve the agenda. Um, oh, Palin, I didn't see you there. I'm sorry. Uh, Palin is a member participating remotely. Would you please identify yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Pelincon, District 2. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Um, any any changes to the agenda? Um, we will take up the consent agenda in a minute. Um, hearing no changes, we will uh, move to general business and appearances. And this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. Again, we ask you to limit your comments to three minutes and we'll start by looking in the room to see if there's anyone who wishes to be heard. Okay. And is there anyone uh, participating online seeking to be uh, recognized? Okay, go right to the city manager. Mr. Mayor, um, I'm, uh, we will be doing some more recognition shortly in the meeting, but I am pleased to announce that today um, we found out that the City of Montpelier Department of Public Works has been awarded the Outstanding Public Works Department of the Year by the New England Chapter of the American Public Works Association. So all six different states and their winning criteria were completed a project that improved the health and safety of the community, implemented a program that increased efficiency and reduced cost, responded to an emergency incident that saved lives and infrastructure, used technology to improve operations and excelled at customer service and are providing services to the community. The only thing they didn't do on the, the list of qualifying events was become an accredited agency. Um, so we're very proud of our DPW. It was just awarded today at the state's uh, Highway Department Roadshow in, in Barrie. So I've got the plaque here and we'll hang it in Public Works, but I thought the council and the public would wanna know that you've got the best Public Works Department in New England, not that it's any great surprise to us, so. Okay, with that, with that we'll move to the consent agenda and I think we have something to take off the consent agenda, agenda cell, or are we okay now? Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I just, I, I needed some clarity. on. So your question's answered and we're all set. Okay. Consent agenda. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Want to want to move the parks awards up to next? Why don't we do that? 
simplest thing to do. So while we're in the awards mode, um, Alec, do you want to do the honors? Created a new award for the city, an annual service award for a staff member or volunteer person. And um, we have the first one, and I'll go out and do the presentation. Since he was the nominee, you do have the write-up. in. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank First of all, welcome Mark uh, here for the award. Um, also want to welcome most of our staff is here, Parks and Trees team, uh, other city employees. Welcome to um, VHCB AmeriCorps staff. We're also here. Um, I want to give them a brief opportunity to say a few words about Mark since they are his um, sponsoring organization with uh, the city. And there's a write up for the award in your packet. And I just wanted to not read it, but just bring a couple things forward for you all and for the public who might not read everything that's included in the city council agenda packet. Um, so uh, this is an annual service award. We have uh, a longstanding above and beyond monthly award for our city employees, which has been great. And um, given everything that happened last year in the flood, um, so many people did go way above and beyond. And I think Mark really stood out as somebody that deserved to be recognized in a way that um, doesn't currently exist. Um, and so the idea for this annual award came forward and I hope that Mark is the first person uh, who will be in a long line of richly deserved um, staff members and community members to win this award um, in the future. So maybe I'll start by offering the floor to AmeriCorps if that works. Is this, can I, yeah, Aaron Riley is the, um, BHCB AmeriCorps director, and um, and then I'll say a couple things. Oh. Oh, that works. How's that sound? Okay. Hi. Thanks, everyone, so much. My name's Erin Riley, and so I'm the BHC AmeriCorps director, and I'm also here with uh, our AmeriCorps coordinator, Maddie Watt, and also Francis Sharpstein, who's also from VHCB. And so we are so grateful to be here to celebrate and recognize the incredible service that Mark provided to the Montpelier community last summer um, during the devastating floods. And so one of the things that we do is we actually collect stories from our members. So I wanted to take a moment to share with you a story that Mark provided directly after um, providing the service um, during the flood. So this is um, Mark's words. On the evening of July 10th, I watched from my apartment window as water rose in through our community doors, windows, streets, homes. Experiencing the flooding through every sense of feeling the relentless rain soak us onlookers as we watched the rising rivers through the streets, of smelling the mixing of toxins coating every surface now touched by the floodwaters, of hearing endless sirens and alarms of buildings with first floors submerged in feet of water. This is where my heart felt hopeless for the evening. But that hopelessness dried away when I heard that the Mont Montpelier Parks team was going to do something. Starting with three tables and a small tent, we found a dry spot to begin helping anyone and everyone willing to come to us. What grew out of the hub was beautiful and challenging. Constantly through days of hundreds, then thousands of people willing to sink into the water's devastation, I spoke to individuals from all walks of life about their stories, their homes, their families, now waiting through what to do next. And with a team of incredible volunteers, we were able to do something to help. Over the following three weeks, we shared tears, straining tools, lifting arms, rumbling generators and pumps, reaching shovels and mud cake boots to find a way to live again as a city. And while the flood's toll is just now being understood and moments of reflection are dawning on the sheer scale of destruction caused in a single evening of rain, we have shown together as a community what it means to be a neighbor. I am so humbled and moved by my chance to help in some small way in this beauty we found while wading through cat catastrophe together. So those are um, in Mark's own words, and I think just really shows uh, what Mark did to step up, to take action. And uh, we are so appreciative and grateful for your exemplary service during the flood. Um, as Alex said, Mark really went above and beyond during those final weeks. Uh, Mark served 222 hours, all directed for flood recovery. 
Uh, and so during that time, Mark really just demonstrated dedication to the community, Montpelier at large, all of Mark's neighbors, um, during a real time of need and uncertainty. And uh, for me and Maddie, uh, Mark was really uh, reminding and encouraging us all through those actions um, that when we are confronted with challenges, we can all come together as a community uh, to connect and to rebuild. Um, and so um, we are also really thankful for Alec and the, the Parks Department uh, for honoring and for all, all of you for honoring Mark um, and the incredible service demonstrated last July. So turn it over to no, no, no. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so the final tally of volunteer hours was um, 14,081 hours, uh, 3,970 individual volunteers um, uh, contributing to flood relief. Um, and the only reason we know that is because of Mark. Um, for those almost 4,000 people that walked up to the hub, or called into the hub or emailed us. You just walked up to a tent and you said, how could I help? And Mark said, you should go to Anna. They need four people starting at 11.30 AM. Um, or they need 12 people out, you know, in some faraway location. Um, and so it seemed very seamless if you walked up um, and you were looking to help. And there was all this stuff happening behind the scenes. So we could take phone calls. People could say the way that they needed help. We could take emails. People would email us how they needed help. Um, people could walk up and say, I need help. And all of that information was being populated into spreadsheets that were being updated live, both at that front table and, and in other places, even offsite. The data was being um, combed through every day, and especially once we learned what kind of reporting FEMA would require, um, it was being updated so that this type of information would be available to us in the end. All of those hours are um, counted toward the city's percentage of match um, funds that will go toward flood relief. Um, so I detail or, you know, the write-up details, kind of some of the technical expertise that Mark brought to bear, um, but that includes kind of setting up all of these systems, um, creating a centralized phone number, setting up an online form for people to request help or so that they wanted to help, um, setting up a digital library that helped us keep track of all of the fans, dehumidifiers, and other tools going in and out of the, the hub, um, keeping track of other just so many random needs. I can still picture the tab on the spreadsheet of other needs, and it ranged in everything you could imagine. Um, and then also coordinating between the si the systems that the city set up um, and then all of the systems that the state was, you know, wanting communities um, to use so that we were making sure that nobody was falling through the cracks. Um, and all that was done in such a way that um, when December came around um, and this flooding, this next flooding event happened, we had a website, it was ready to go. We had a phone number people could call. We had an email that people knew about. All of those, that information came directly to a spreadsheet that was live updated. We were able to set up a hub outside of City Hall in just a couple hours. Um, and so the, the systems that Mark set up are resilient and will be seeing us through into future uh, emergency events. Um, and then um, I will just close by saying that um, we, our leadership team has read a number of books about um, leadership and organizational um, development. And one of the key themes, if you've ever read these books that shows up over and over again, is getting the right people on board um, on your team. And I just feel so lucky to have worked with Marek or served with Marek um, over the last year and a half and, and feel fortunate that he is on board our team and um, count him among the best people um, to be in the city of Montpelier and we're, we're lucky to have them. So Mark, I have a black for you here. Maybe <laughs> just a quick, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, Thank you very much. And I can't wait for this next year of service with the city of Montpelier. Thank you. Well, hopefully it will be less busy. Yes, <laughs> yes, I hope so, in a different way. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. And then is there a bigger plaque to show too, or is this the- uh... one, This is the one that will hang City Hall with his name on it. And 
Uh, sure, of course. The award that will hang in, in City Hall. And, uh, thank you, Alex, for bringing us up. Thank you, Mark, for all you did. And all the whole parks team, you know, I, Mark was certainly the face of that, but really every single one of you were out there every day, really doing yeoman version and uh, smile on your face the whole time. All right. Thank you, everybody. You know, I uh, may come across as uh, a little defensive sometimes when I say this, but when people have asked over the last year, well, where was city government? in uh, responding to the flood? This is the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. All right. Next up, we have business personal property report. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> 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 you want to <laughs> can't believe I have to follow that up. <clears throat> um, so my name is Marty Liger, said I'm the, the assessor. And I met with some folks um, from downtown businesses and Montpelier Alive uh, recently, and they're concerned about the um, the business personal property assessment that the city has in place. Um, <clears throat> their concern is that the flood um, prompted them to have to buy new equipment, raising their values from last year to this year. So the spreadsheet that I handed out has um, the previous values before the flood. The first column is 2023 values. Um, and the next line is the tax amount that it generated last year. That total amount is $14,000 in tax revenue based on the 2023 assessments. Um, I don't know what the 2024 values are going to be yet because we still have, as you can see, quite a few businesses that haven't reported yet. Um, their concern is that they don't want to have to go through the abatement process. Um, they feel it's unfair uh, that their assessments are going to go up because of the flood. Um, so my suggestion would be to roll... Um, that that list that I provided has eighty <clears throat> has eighty one accounts on it. I believe there are four of them that are, have closed and are not coming back. So there's about seventy seven accounts on here. Um, if we roll those back to the twenty twenty three values, it will still generate approximately the fourteen thousand dollars in tax revenue um, without having to put extra burden onto the folks that are downtown struggling already. Does that make sense? I just want to offer a little clarification in the, the memo that you got. It just says to roll it back to last year's tax rate, and it really means tax value. So just we're not changing whatever the tax rate will be. It'll just be for this group of people on their property tax because they, they basically involuntarily upgraded their equipment. Um, we would hold them for a year to help them recover. And then they realize that next year, yeah. It'll be it'll be leveling, leveling uh, up. And if we don't do that, then that's going to be 77 people that are going to have to fill out their abatement forms. They're going to have to come in front of the abatement board. And, you know, some of these accounts, um, tax the tax amounts, um, I believe it should be on your sheet there, $300, $132. I mean, we're talking about inconveniencing people for a few thousand bucks. Mm-hmm. Well, some of us just spent a lot of time listening to uh, abatement requests. This seems like a real efficient way to handle this. Uh, any any questions from members of the council? Sal? So what what happens next year? Uh, next year, we're going to do this process all over again. They're going to fill out values based on what they currently are as of April 1, 2025. Uh, if they want an abatement, they'll have to come forward Um <laughs> barring any other devastating events. But if we're continuing on business as usual, they're going to pay market value. Okay. Lauren. And just clarifying, so this was your proposal and the business, the impacted businesses, this was looked favorably by them as just, the right solution? Most, yes, just the impacted of? businesses. We don't want to do the whole city because yeah. not everybody was. This is just a list of people that, have, that came to Montpelier Alive looking for help. 
Um, there are some other downtown businesses that did not come forward looking for any help. Um, there is still the abatement process for those folks if they if they decide. I can let people know in uh, preparation for this. I, you know, people think, well, do we really need this business uh, personal property tax? Because uh, you know, it's it's kind of a pain for the businesses to do it. And so I asked uh, Sarah Lacroix, our finance director, how much money it generates, and it's like three hundred forty-three thousand dollars a year. It's a lot of money. So we can't just we couldn't afford to just stop doing it. Correct, because uh, yeah, that would be a shift onto all the other taxpayers uh, with a significant increase. Yeah, it also requires a vote of the public to do that. This council can't do it. You know, it would have to be a vote of the mm -hmm. city. And I feel like a one-time blanket abatement for the folks that were affected is probably the best solution to their their uh, concerns. Okay, is there a motion to approve this? Move. We uh, recommend to tax flooded businesses at the 2023 tax rate. Tax value. Yeah. Oh, and you're right. and okay. Tax value. Yeah. Whatever the right uh, phrase. Yeah. Is. Okay. Not yours. No. And is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Thanks for coming in. Okay. We have uh, a list of appointments. And what I think I'm going to do is t take the Harry Sheridan Scholarship Committee appointment first, because all that's a city council slot, and then all the others will just take them up together. And the Harry Sh Sheridan Scholarship Committee is... Uh, is a program to uh, award uh, scholarship to a student, a graduating senior at Montpelier High School. It uh, involves uh, essentially one meeting a year, and it has been. It's always been a member of the city council getting, uh, being appointed to do that. I've been in touch with the uh, guidance counselor at the high school who is uh, in charge of this project and whoever wants whoever takes this on would need to be available for a meeting sometime before the end of this week um and and I got her to send me the application packets for everyone who has uh, applied for this scholarship so that uh, if if there's someone here who wants to do it I would I would get that to them right away and so you could then connect with the uh with her um having looked in my calendar i'm available to do it so i could do it but i'm also happy if someone else uh, wants to volunteer to do it gee sounds oh, okay sounds good i will send this stuff to you probably during our break of interest, you know, because we don't hear about this one too often, and it's kind of cool that Mr. Sheridan left this money. How much is it? And I don't there, know that. You don't know yet. Okay. No. Right. <laughs> no, it's uh, th that would be good to know. Maybe our new representative can bring that information back to us. Um, you know, there there is some uh, stipend that goes along with it, uh, and different different people on the council have had it. So, well, there you go. I'll send, I'll send that to you. Okay, next up, we have, is there a motion to appoint? So moved. Is there a second? Awesome. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone willing to be make it be really awkward by voting no? <laughs> okay. Thanks, Gary. All right. Next up, we have a list of other appointments. Uh, the grant committee. We have three applications. And is anyone uh, participating? I don't see anyone in person. 
Is anyone uh, for? Oh, okay. Oh, you are right. Okay, so the, the applicants for that are Edward Haggett, Casey Whiteley, Stan Brinkerhoff, and Ken Jones. And I don't see any of them online. Um, and then we have the tree board applicants, Nancy Stone and Worth Allen. Uh, appointments to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, Eva Zimet, um, Development Review Board, Brian David Jones and Joseph Ryan Kiernan, the Planning Committee, Planning Commission, uh, Sean Linehan, and the Energy Advisory Committee, Mark Seltzer. So I would entertain a motion to appoint all of those people if if that's your pleasure or we could go into executive session Terry um, I have a question about the development review board are there are there some that have certain terms they're like I can't for some reason I can't open the files and I'm having trouble with my computer so I can't read it but yeah the terms are set by charter and typically they are there's multiple overlapping terms so like two years the next you kind of like your council terms are staggered so the only reason they would be different terms is if someone was filling an unfilled term so they because if you're and that wouldn't be this time of year because we so all the so i think the planning commission term might be filling an unfilled term but the, the, all the drbs come available this time of year and all the planning commission in the fall so um they should both be two-year terms and the memo uh accompanying the uh, development Review Board says two regular and one alternate seat expiring May 12th. And there's also a regular seat vacancy for the remainder of a three-year term that ends uh, in 2026. So since these, since we have two applicants uh, for people and they're, I don't think they indicated that they don't want full terms, I would say we put them both on for uh, three-year terms um, expiring in 2027. So is there a motion? Go ahead. <laughs> the Energy Advisory Committee, what's that? I don't have any list. Okay. So, um, um, I'm just going to try to, and I, and I can't, you know what, can someone else do it? I'm sorry, because I can't see all the, the details. Are you, are you moving to appoint all the people that the mayor needs? Yeah. That's so a that good works. That's it, that works. Then I'll yeah. move to all, the people, to all of the terms, to all of the committees, which what the mayor said, but I don't know if that works. Yeah. Or, that works. Uh, that'll work fine. What were the terms of those two? Two there, times, three year terms. Two of the permanent, three. per two permanent three year terms for uh, the DRB. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there a second? All those in favor? Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Yes. Did we previously, just for the grant committee, it being new, is there a council person or people serving on that and or staff liaison? Did we figure? I know that there was a very detailed proposal from Adrian, but we might, if we haven't done that, that might be good to figure that out quickly. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I, I, think, <laughs> I think we've got a volunteer for that. <laughs> Yeah. Were you going to say something, Bill? Well, I was going to let you decide your appointees first. I mean, I would like to be the city council rep for the grant committee. Yeah. Okay. So we have up to three. So staff person, we're, we're evaluating that now I had some conversation with Adrian and we might 
wait and see how much is needed, but we're definitely open to that. Just figure out who the best person will be. We don't have someone designated yet. Okay. Do we want to have a motion to appoint Adrian to that uh, slot? The commission positions you didn't move. They do, they weren't moved as a vote. Yeah. I thought they were. I thought I thought Councillor the list when you go through of who does what and everything, it was not an actual Oh no. Oh I see. Oh, okay. It's always better to I think. There's a there's a record and a vote if we do that. So is there a motion to appoint Adrian? <laughs> as the city council representative on the grants committee. And is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next item is going to be very quick. Short-term rental second reading. Do you want to... Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, uh, as you may recall, we had a meeting in, I believe it was April, uh, about this topic. You voted to set the public hearing for tonight. The Housing Committee has asked that it be tabled to a later date, possibly sometime in June. So we'd recommend that you simply re you know, vote to, to continue the hearing to a future date to be determined um, by the city manager, uh, in to be set by the city manager, rather than set a specific date, because then we could float it if... Yep, needed. All right. Is there a motion for that? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. So so actually, you should open this one. Okay. Move to continue it. So we will uh, open the second reading, uh, public hearing for a second reading of short-term rental ordinance. And now, is there a motion? We'll move that we continue the hearing to a future date certain to be determined by the city manager. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, I'll close the public hearing and we will take it up again in the future. All right. Up to item 16 already. The strategic plan, advance economy, economy and community prosperity. So as you can see, the, the person who actually knows what they're talking about on this is not here tonight. So you got the B team. Um, Fortunately, this is the shortest one of all of the strategies. So, um, and do I is, is this actual Zoom or is this PDF? I mean, PowerPoint. Okay, so I can just do it, the slideshow from the beginning. Great. Got it. Oh, okay. Oh, it looks like it's okay up there. Yes. That's all I, that's fine. Oh, on Zoom. Oh, sorry. I'm good. Thank you, Evelyn, for that help. Uh, so we are here to do the fourth of the five strategic plans. This one is community prosperity. Uh, once upon a time, I think this was called economic development. But over the years, we've amended it a little bit uh, through the council. It is a fairly brief one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We've gone, this is the same intro we've had. Um, we are going through the, the plans and where we're at. Uh, we've talked about kind of that we're at the 30,000 foot. We've set a purpose statement. We've set some big strategic goals. And now we're talking about the action items. Uh, and this is the strategic plan for all the goals. So at our, our next meeting, we'll be talking about public health and safety and the adopted strategic plan. Uh, again, we've talk, talked about this at our retreat last week. We talked about how we're going to go through all of these. And then in June, we would um, try to finalize all this to have it go into effect on July 1 for at least a three-year period. So we'd be making 
uh, some alterations to some of these documents. So um, our rebuild and plan for future resilience. Excuse uh, me, Bill. Yep. I, I'm not sure that what I'm seeing on, it's all the same content as what's on the screen, but uh, what I'm seeing on my Zoom screen is has all the little icons, the camera oh, okay. and stuff like um, that. Yeah. Okay. I, and for people don't warn me about that. in television land, it might be okay. yep. better to get that. Okay. Hey, there we go. Ah, thank you. And then where's my screen to move things? Oh, I see. Got it. Okay. There we are. Okay, so we, uh, oops, we already did that. So we're moving into our uh, community prosperity plan. And again, I think this one is very short and I think is one that uh, perhaps when we come around to it, we might want to put some more work into it. Uh, but basically, the support health of downtown has always been one of our very top things. This year, we looked specifically at keeping the post office downtown, which we think we're successful so far. Look at incentives and tools to enhance use of downtown and continue our partnership with Mount Lawyer Live and consider the recommendations for the Commission for Recovery and Resilience. At some point, they will be coming in with us. I think it was really, this was a, a real clue to us to just keep our efforts to keep downtown healthy and work with the important partners. Um, this was one I don't even know. This is an old one from last year, support congregate meals at the Cedar Center and kitchen space and future community center design. Um, that might be a little more specific than where we're at right now. So uh, something to think about in June. Uh, that was a real sense at one point to have kitchen space there. I don't know if that's still a need. And lastly, I think it was to embrace outdoor recreation. We talked in the past about making us an outdoor recreation. So we would complete our trail projects that make strategic investments and review the public arts master plan. And that public arts commission will be doing that. As you know, we didn't put any funding in for them to actually do projects. And that's it for this goal. Um, so there are basically, uh, we need to, what our next is to establish our performance measures uh, that tie to the performance standards for all of these to give you some metrics to report out at the fiscal year end on the status of where we are this year. And then uh, we've got the list of council decision items uh, that we've been keeping a running track of that will start showing up on your agendas as we're going forward. Um, so uh, I think the, um, well, this looks like not this. Oh, this is. I wonder if this is left over from one from before. This looks like one we've already covered. Uh, um, yeah, so we will be, our uh, grade by grade review is that we will be uh, looking at this goal this week, public health and safety goal next week. Uh, although it's not a goal, we talked about the, the sort of practice of good governance. So we'll, and and uh, we also have, wouldn't have a normal place to give you an overview of the, the, what we call the admin department. So we'll be doing that. Uh, tonight, after I'm done, you'll be getting updates on the community service departments, and uh, next week you'll be getting updates from the public safety departments. Uh, we will establish our long-term planning cycles and then completing projects that work to meet all those goals. Oops, what did I just do? Something I didn't want to do. Um, no, I just stopped the share. that that's oops. sorry for taking a sh short one and making it longer well I'm, I'm seeing determined to uh, mess this up. So uh, fortunately, we were at the questions and comments section. So um, we will leave it at that. Like I said, this is the, definitely the least populated of all of our plans and one that uh, certainly would take comments and questions and suggestions tonight, but also something to think about as we talk about in June. Um, but that's where we're at. Okay. That's, that's the overview. Thanks, Bill.
Council members, do we have any questions or comments at this point? And, and I'll just throw out the question that I've thrown out a couple of times, which is, do our various departments of city government have the capacity to do everything that we're saying we're going to do? Uh, on this list, yes, <laughs> definitely. And not as challenging as some of the other lists we've seen. And so should we be giving you more to do? Possibly. I mean, I think this is an area we, you know, at, at least we ought to be thinking about, particularly in a longer term plan, um, what where we want to make some investments in going forward in some of this area. You know, I will say that a lot of the things that might normally fall under what we would call economic development are in like housing and infrastructure, you know, so where I talked about the development agreements, the TIF, those kinds of things. So it's not that they're not in here, they're just under different sections. But I certainly mm -hmm. think if we had more specific uh, thoughts about, particularly with the downtown and, um, you know, we have had um, and anything in, ter in terms of the recreation, uh, you know, making, as we think about the health of downtown and we think about things that draw people to our community, um, you know, we don't have as much employment downtown as we used to have. So what else can can we create, whether it's arts? I think arts and recreation are those things that would people could come. And so those are areas we could look at. Uh, what, what do we need to make this a different kind of destination than what it used to be? Um, one of the things that I, uh, that just occurs to me is in the wake of the flood, we have spaces that, uh, that are vacant and what can we do to get, get businesses back in, into those spaces? I think, um, that's a great question. I think some of it has to do with the building owner. Some folks are making a lot of renovations before they rent their spaces. Others um, did them very promptly. Uh, different owners have a different profile of how they want to proceed. So we, as and as well as Montpelier Alive, are in you know contact with those owners. And but uh, there's only you know there's only so much I think we can do to force people to move um, and to find tenants that seek to be in those spaces at agreeable terms. Mm -hmm. Do we do we have an inventory of like vacant spaces? I suspect that we do. I don't have it. We don't have it here tonight. I think Montpelier Alive keeps that on a running basis. And us, Josh, do you know if you, you folks keep that? No. So we, I know we have it in this building. I just, it's, I think it's been, that uh -huh. was something we used to do and it kind of, it got transferred over to the downtown group when they were formed. Yeah. It seems like we should. Uh, Tim. Jack, like kind of looking at this list and deciding maybe we should connect with Montpelier Live on this one if they haven't seen it. But I know there's been conversation about maybe just a new initiative to clean up downtown. It's it, downtowns are always hard to keep clean, but the dust factor from the flood is just mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Um, but so maybe kind of maybe some efforts to clean up, remove trash more. And, and we've had an initiative, but it never quite kept up. Because I think a lot of what brings people in is food, restaurants, Lost Nation Theater, the movie theaters, reasons people come to town, and you want it to be appealing for them. Um, so I would think something along those lines in here would be important. And I do think the empty property thing is worth inventorying, because I think there's a few that are really obvious, but there's also a bunch more that are quietly just sitting there, and we should mm -hmm. check on those. So perhaps under the support, you know, the, the, the part about supporting the downtown, we could add uh, uh, in, an inventory of uh, vacant spaces and uh, set a priority for cleanliness and of downtown, something like that. We could draw something for the June. Uh-huh. Adrian. I just have a clarifying question. So now that they released the city plan and there's a section in there, that's art and culture, which has some really good ideas. How does that align to some of these strategic um, initiatives? So the release of the city plan is just a draft, a long way from, so it, there's a long, there, there will be a community process, then the planning commission will review it, and then it will come to you. So after you adopt it sometime this fall, then it becomes the actual city plan. And then I, I think 
you know, what we've been trying to do is take a look at those things and make sure they line up with these, that there's nothing inconsistent. And then I would like to think that next spring when we're reviewing this and we have an adopted plan, that might, you know, to the extent that we're making changes in it, it might be to really make sure everything's in full alignment. Yeah. So, uh, as long as we're talking about empty spaces, um, does anyone know what's going on with the RK Miles lot? I don't. I, I heard a rumor from a reliable source yesterday, but I, I that's all it is, so I don't want to repeat it in public. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, I haven't seen much. I mean, yeah. it's cleaned up, but I haven't seen much yeah. happening. No, no. Lauren. Um, just one thing. Uh, so we've got considered recommendations from the Commission for Recovery and Resilience, um, and the Commission, like we're having a public meeting May 23rd, 6.30 p.m. I know that one of the concepts coming forward does have to do with working with the downtown business owners on a specific project. So I think that could be a venue where we try to collaborate to make some um, progress on that and do some specific outreach on, I mean, that's, you know, focused on flood resilience and stuff for the buildings, but I think it would be an uh, like entry point for being in touch with the various owners and stuff. So there might be a way to collaborate in there too. So just, just to get that on people's radar that um, that initiative could give us a way to work on some of these other things as well. Right. I think that's one of the reasons why we kept this somewhat small because uh, at the time we were talking about this last fall, you know, we had just formed the commission and clearly flood recovery and resilience was top of all of our minds still is. And, um, and I think the thought was rather than us, the city, trying to articulate all the projects and things that need to be done, we've just created a group whose mission is to do that. And when they come in, they're going to have, you know, they've already got like 13 items that they're focusing on. And some of them have to do with the health and economic vitality of downtown. So, um, you know, I could, we will get those lists and then those, some of those will be perhaps done independently, but some of those will become our projects, which will then end up in in these plans. And so I think part of it was like, hey, that, that just is considered their recommendations, but that's actually, you know, a, a big one. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Keeping in mind, you know, as we've, as we've been going along, our plan is to finalize the whole package probably at the second meeting in June. And we'll make those adjustments. We'll add those couple of things in that you just mentioned. And if you think, you know, as always, if you think of other things, either send them in or we could talk about them in June as well. Okay. I don't want to cut anyone off who doesn't, who wants to say something and hasn't, but I also don't want to needlessly drag things on. If there's anyone online who would like to be recognized, please indicate with your electronic hand. Okay, Lauren. To drag out, but I know we do have Alec here and like the all around adventure and all the parks initiatives. I don't know if there's anything that you wanna share about like what's going on or like what we might expect over the next year. But it's, it's always intriguing That's to hear your, your good ideas. Yeah. Because yes. you're coming up in the next department so we, overview. So the okay. next, the so next we'll part is, is parks, uh, seniors, and rec. Um, so to do the community services. So those are your department overviews for this meeting. So they're the only thing standing between you and them is this conversation. Is you. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bill. Can I stop the share now? Yes. Um, next up, community services overview. Parks, Rec, and Senior Center.
everybody. <laughs> Is that what mic's working? Nobody turned it off on me. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, being here to listen to us talk about some of the things we do. Um, I'm going to talk about the overview of the recreation piece. Um, <clears throat> some of the things about us, our services, our budget, challenges and opportunities, and what's next. So about us, for those of you who are new on the the city council, the community services department provides for the health and well-being of the Montpelier community by offering educational, recreational, social, and indoor and outdoor opportunities for all. Recreation is one of the three departments within community services. <clears throat> our mission that we've um, are always working to achieve better and better every year is, is for the recreation department is to provide a variety of quality programs, community events, and recreational services in a safe and affordable manner, and to effectively develop and maintain recreational facilities for all residents of the community. Our team right now is, is one short. We still have a frozen position. Um, I, I'm the Director of Recreation and Senior Services, so I, I'm involved with a couple of departments. Heidi's my assistant who helps, um, who oversees the pool and the day camp and a lot of other things we have on throughout the year, youth sports and things like that. Um, James Richardson is our maintenance foreman and Dakota Powers is our maintenance assistant. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. Some of our budget constraints is budget spending. Um, we're, we're trying to spend only on things that are necessary. As everybody knows, with the flood, it's caused a hardship with um, uh, money in the city. So we're, at, we're all trying to do our part to reduce spending wherever we can. One of our, one of our big challenges, of course, is our aging infrastructure. Um, anybody who would like to do a, a tour of our facilities, I'd be happy to work with you on scheduling a time to take you so you can see what we have. Um, but many infrastructure areas with our future maintenance needs to continue the longevity of the facilities. Unfortunately, everything needs tender love and care if we want it to, to last for um, a lot longer. The current recreation center has many needs that must be improved. Um, so anybody who hasn't been in that building, that'll be an education for you to have the opportunity to see it. It was an armory back in 1932, and the city bought it for $25,000 back in, I think it was 1969 or 70. Um, one of our next challenges is recovering the Dog River Fields. We actually had done a bunch of work last fall, got, got them reseeded, hoping to use them this spring. And then our nice December flood and then another flood after that has got us back to the beginning. But that's, that's one of our areas <clears throat> that we have that is real right now our only area that we can fit adult softball fields. Um, our other facilities can cover other things like soccer and base, baseball for youth. And of course the field of Mountaineers play on for bigger programs. Um, but adult softball, that's our only space that we have enough room for a softball field. Um, staffing right now, again, I'm oversee, I oversight of senior and recreation. Um, we have one frozen position, which is a, is an office position, which is really creating some challenges right now for us with uh, registrations as we're going into summer. Things are getting, getting, for lack of a better word, heated up with the heat and the pool coming on board. People are, are getting excited about stuff. Um, and then the other thing we, we had to do in our budget was reduce some seasonal positions. So our, our numbers are down with, and I should say when I say seasonal, it's mostly around the maintenance area. Um, so that'll be that'll be a challenge, but things we'll continue to work on. One of the things we're really looking forward to is the community engagement with Country Club Road. I, I think there's there's a real opportunity for recreation, not just outdoor recreation, which we hear a lot about, but the one thing we don't really have is, it, we certainly don't have is a great indoor recreation space. And for anybody who follows some of the recreation 
you know, from the past that where we, we had more opportunities for indoor space. Um, the one beauty of recreation is it does actually bring people to a community. It does generate revenue, um, you know, in some areas, which helps support what we do. But just as an example of one of the things we used to do prior to the flood was the uh, parent-child Valentine's dance. And we used to have um, the florist um, tell us that they have no more flowers left or the places where people went out to dinner were all booked solid on that night because of all the people that were taking their, their children out to eat or buying dresses or suits or whatever. So it was probably a pretty good economic boost to the community, just a, a simple event like that. Um, <clears throat> our budget this year, we did reduce off the um, appropriation that we've received. Um, we we, we uh, lowered it $37,900 <clears throat> from the previous year. And again, just with budget challenges, we're trying to do our part to help um, keep things under cost control. Um, these are the areas that are, you know, are a lot of our expenses for our department. Our rec field area includes our our full-time maintenance staff, our seasonal day camp staff, and also our seasonal maintenance staff as well. Um, rec admin is myself, my assistant, and our office person who's in, in that area. Um, pool is, of course, all of our pool area. Rec center is, is what supports everything that happens in the rec center for open gym and activities and things like that. And then our core services are many. Um, you know, recreation is one of those areas that we kind of cover the, the span from birth to death, for lack of a better term. Um, we have people of all ages that use our programs, which is really exciting. And I know nobody's ever heard of this sport before, but pickleball is continuing to to grow and uh, a lot of enthusiasm um, continues. And people have already asked if they can play in the gym through the summer because they don't even want to be outside. They want to stay inside and play. <clears throat> um, and then also, I, I'm also involved, as I said, with the senior center, but also oversight of the feast program. Um, and budget and facility management. Um, what's next is our community engagement of Country Club Road, working with the community to enhance the potential for meeting recreational needs now and into the future. Those of you who have heard me talk about this before, it's you know it's, it's not about today or tomorrow that we have to be thinking about recreation or the, for the community. It's about the next 50 and 100 years into the future. You know, what what helps bring people to a community? It's stuff to do. Um, and then meeting and event rental possibilities. That's one of the things we're looking at, short-term rentals for, um, and when I say short-term, like meetings and stuff like that. Um, recent improvements to the existing building need to be uh, used for rentals while space is being developed and space for current recreation programs because again we don't have the use of the schools that we used to have so we're we're working on making plans for using a bunch, a bunch of that indoor space up at the uh, former elks club which i'm very excited about because if we can get people up there for the indoor space in the winter you can see the opportunity they have to come in, to go out and do skiing and different things like that while they're up there renting indoor space um and I'll keep it to my, hopefully my limit and thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well done. Thanks, Arnie. Um, what, since you mentioned staffing, one of the things that immediately occurred to me is how are things looking for getting, uh, hiring enough staff for the pool this summer? Right, right now we're doing pretty well with pool staff. Um, we actually sent out contracts for the pool staff the other day. We're working on our day camp staff right now. Um, you know, because that being a licensed child care for that program, we do have to keep ratios for kids to staff. So um, so there's a lot a lot going on with that. And um, the, again, the challenging part is just we reduced our seasonal maintenance budget because, again, trying to reduce some of the cost to the to the taxpayers and helping with our budget. So with adding more space, it creates more challenges. So we have to uh, be creative on how we manage the outdoor facilities. Thanks.
Go ahead, Mary. Adrian. Thank you for the presentation. Um, recreation is really important to me. I have two kids that have grown up going to the rec center every week playing basketball and they are so sad it's over. <laughs> um, we looked the other day. I'm like, nope, it's over for the season. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask that I've done in previous jobs um, was the opportunity to have a joint use agreement with the schools. Um, it is an organ. It's a structure that is usually between two government entities, city and the school, where we have beautiful facilities, you know, at the elementary, the middle school and the high school. And I was wondering if there was ever thought around having that agreement with the schools to use their facility, um, you know, for basketball or pickleball. Um, I don't know what that looks like in Montpelier, but like I know my kids and their friends would love to play basketball all year round, and so I don't know what that has ever been talked about. One of, one of the areas that we are we are using currently for youth basketball is the middle school gym on Saturdays, so we do have use of that. Um, I'm not sure how far back you know about our history, but prior to was it 2016, um, we used to be under the school system. The recreation department was so we were under the school system and we actually had full use of all their facilities when they weren't using them and then we did for a few years afterwards but when covid hit just a few things changed i think part of the challenge with getting into the schools um i believe is that they're also having challenges getting staff you know, to cover evening shifts. So they don't have a person in the building sometimes, like they used to have a custodian that might be there till 10 at night. Um, so I don't, you know, I mean, I'm more than willing to work with the schools. I know, I know there has been a bit of a setback since COVID um, and they do use our facilities, our outdoor facilities. So, so we do share, um, they used to use dog river a lot more, but now it's a little, <laughs> it's a mess. So we got some work down there, but um yeah, with the with the Elks property coming on board, we actually have expanded some soccer areas up there. This we're going to do some ultimate frisbee camps this summer. Um, we're also working with uh, a group that we're hopefully will be able to work it out, getting sponsored, doing some other activities up there. But I'll keep that a secret for now, but we're kind of excited about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed to working with the schools, but the challenge that you have though. Um, with the schools not having a dedicated space is that typically from three to nine every night during basketball season, the schools are practicing. So we can't get kids in the gym and, and we can't start kids at nine o'clock. So that's, that, that is one of the challenges that the school space is limited during sports seasons. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is a great overview. Um, so I have a question about the dog river fields. And um, I'm, I'm thinking that I don't know what the, the commission on recovery and resilience is thinking about um, in terms of flood mitigation and places for the river to go. But I'm thinking about, you know, this very low area right next to the river that is, didn't just flood in July, but can keeps flooding so much that you can't fix it, that um it seems like it might be a good idea for us to be thinking in terms of finding somewhere else to do the things that are happening there, even though I understand that adult softball in particular is mm -hmm. not a place where there's another obvious place, but just thinking kind of long-term uh, and I'm not a river expert, so I don't know about managing yeah. the, the river. I'm, but... I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we just having a bad year and that when we recovered the field back in uh, after 2011, after Irene, the first flood, if you remember, it hit in May. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. you know, we kind of were trying to set up stuff to see what FEMA would cover. So we really didn't rush. And then we started to rototill to prep for the project that we were going to start to do. And then we got hit again in August. Um, the construction company was good enough to keep their bid the same. So once we recovered the field um, and had seed planted by the middle of September, we were actually back on those fields in the spring for softball, um, a little bit later for soccer because grass takes about a year um, to recover for people to really play hard sports on it. Otherwise, it tears it up really fast. Um, but but the reason the reason those are fields down there is because if it wasn't a floodplain, there'd probably be condos down there. So a lot of your sports fields in Vermont 
I've said this a few times, are in the floodplains because you can't build on them. Um, and field space is a real premium, you know, and if you let it grow up to a brush lot, it just might be another place where, you know, um, you might have more tenting and different things that, you know, that people may find it as a place to camp or, or whatever, you know? So, I mean, it is a challenge, but I'm hoping that we can find ways to recover that field in a more efficient way. And it, it may not be perfect. We may not go through a contractor every time this happens. We work on doing it ourselves and keep the cost, you know, to a minimum and plant seed, you know? So that's kind of the fortunate, fortunate thing for us is if you go down at that field, there's not a lot of stones on it. We got silt and a lot of area stuff like that. But if you go down and look at the Norwich rugby field, I don't know if anybody's been over there by the Mayo nursing home that also has been flooded several times this year. And they had it all put back together last fall and it got ripped up again, but they have stones out on that field. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work just to pick the stones up. So for us, we can pretty much rototill and then drag it and seed it. You know, if that's, if that's where we need to go. So, that as well we you know i think you're aware we are also in the process of doing a project to elevate the, that road that goes across there because it has actually served as a flood prevention dam to protect the wastewater plants we're actually going to be raising it and engineering that so we have uh, actually protection up to the 500 year flood so we are we're counting on that field as a place to hold water uh and and arnie's right you know we talked a lot about this that that when you look, you know, fee, yes, we have to repair a field, but compared to some of the buildings or housing or those kind of things, it's a relatively inexpensive fix. And FEMA doesn't, you know, it's not a big deal to put a field back. So, you know, you might miss a season. So I, we actually, it is a fairly decent strategy to put things back as long as you don't have big expensive scoreboards that can be in the flood water and those kind of things. So it's not a bad use for a low area. Right. Yeah, just wanted to um, note also, you had mentioned like commission projects, and there is um, an analysis that Vermont Emergency Management is doing right now that the commission's looking closely at that's looking within the city at different um, like floodplain restoration possibilities and doing an analysis of, you know, what would have the biggest impact. So I'm hoping and I can try to get clarity of, you know, would a site like that, if would they be looking at it for floodplain restoration and does it have a lot of potential or not? And so if it turned out that doing something different with it would be really helpful for flood risk reduction or something, then hopefully that's the kind of thing we're going to be learning. Um, so that's also going on. I know that whole area is being looked at. There's like that, pin, the angle in the river is like a pinch point and does contribute to flooding. So I, I imagine we'll get some data on that. That could be interesting, but um, can definitely share that as we learn more. Um, and Jack, I did want to note Donna has her hand up online. It's hard to see you. Donna. Uh, thank you, um, Lauren, for, for, for noticing me. And I want to first easy comment is definitely that allowing an athletic field to be flooded is really terrific and that we can restore it. My question is more to Arnie about, I know there is a freezing on hiring, but I also know that the senior center has a, I'm going to say communication, marketing, I'm not sure the exact title that person has. And one of the things I really supported about the community services is that the idea was to have an umbrella, not only of a director like yourself, but also someone who is a specialist in grant writing, was a specialist in communications. So I don't know of any other department within the community service other than the senior center that has a specific person for communication marketing. But I'd like to see that person transition to more of an umbrella possibility while we're doing this doing this freezing of, of hiring people. Is that a possibility? Is that something you're looking at, Arnie? He's he's actually shared with the other departments. We're, we have a smaller percentage, um, but he does do some stuff for us. Um, that helps with marketing and um, grant stuff. Yeah, and likewise, the parks. I mean, that's another big piece. Yeah, and parks as well. Yeah, yeah. good, good, because that's that's really important ultimately to get someone who's really there 
uh, for all of the services under community services. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And he's in the room now. Yeah, you're not seeing the nodding in the back of the room, Donna, but yes. Anybody else? Tim. I guess we'll discuss a lot of this with the process coming up, so I don't want to dive in too deep, but um, it is interesting that the S and them with the schools thing just always grates on me <laughs> because it's us. We're a community. We all, the same people write the checks and pay the bills and support it all. And so whenever I hear there's discomfort between us using their gym, it's like, no, we want to use our gym. Um, and I think we've got to be stronger with that and figure this out. I mean, and if it means reorganizing and putting rec back under schools to make it work, I'm okay with that. Um, but I think we need to really look at the whole picture uh, because we do have resources there and they're not being completely used as much as they could be. And, uh, we can make it work for, for the tens of millions of dollars we're looking at spending in this process. We can spend a lot less and activate some facilities we already have. But but I do look forward to the process because we do need to discuss. I think that building on Berry Street doesn't need to be in our future. And we need to look at how we're going to move forward. So thank you. Okay. You want to unshare? <laughs> Or somebody else's computer, or have have an ex, have an expert on share for you. Thanks, Arnie. Thank you. So my name is Amy Pitten, and I am the Director of Membership and Program, Program and Membership, at the Senior Center. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you and to have the opportunity to talk about how the Montpelier Senior Activity Center contributes to meeting the city's strategic goals, particularly the one um, around community prosperity for residents and local businesses so that peace, people's basic needs are met. I've learned a lot in the last three months that I have been the director, uh, and I hope you will ask me questions at the end. That being said, I may not have the answers for you, and I will have to find them out. As our mission and vision statement says, the Montpelier Senior Activity Center is a vital resource for older adults in central Vermont. MSAC's mission is to enhance aging adults' quality of life by offering opportunities that enhance dignity, reduce social isolation, support independence, and encourage community involvement, a mission that falls directly within the purview of this fourth strategic goal of the city that you are looking at tonight. MSAC has a great staff doing good work. In the MSAC office, Norma Maurice is the office manager for all three of the community service entities and has been with the city for more than 25 years. Matt Wilson, who is sitting behind me, also works for community services doing communications and development, and you just heard his position be, being discussed. He has been employed by the city for two years. Poem Mutino is the director of the FEAST program, which provides the Meals on Wheels uh, meals, as well as the congregate lunches at MSAC, and has been with the city for a year and a half. Shalanda James creates delicious meals as the FEAST executive chef and has been with the city for about three years. We also have two trainees working with us through the Senior Community Service Employment Program. And they are Martha Brown and Yona Shahar. MSAC serves more than just the city of Montpelier. We have members and participants from 21 towns that surround the city. 
as well as three members from out of state who participate by Zoom. Six of those towns, East Montpelier, Berlin, Middlesex, Callis, Worcester, and Moortown, support MSAC financially through appropriations. MSAC is both member-focused and driven. Our membership currently stands at 779 members, 536 from Montpelier and 243 from the surrounding area. We are working hard to get back to pre-pandemic numbers, which were over 1,000. An advisory council of nine to 12 members listens to the membership and advises me as the director on the membership's needs and wants. Four committees, which include membership, program, finance, and fundraising are also involved, also involve members in specific tasks uh, according to those committees. One way to get a picture of MSAC is to look at some of our key metrics. For example, this spring, which runs uh, this spring session, which runs from April 1st to June 30th. MSAC is running 40 classes in the arts, humanities, and wellness, which equates to 485 class hours and an enrollment of 680 students. In 2023, our Feast Senior Meals Program produced over 24,000 meals, the majority of which were Meals on Wheels delivered meals, but also included grab-and-go grab meals and congregate meals. Each year, we send a survey out to our members. Last year, as we were still coming back from COVID, a full third of the participants rated their interest in MSAC's programs with a perfect score of 10 out of 10. And remember, I mentioned those six of our neighboring towns that appropriate money for MSAC. The total of those appropriations voted in town meetings in 2024 was $44,400. These metrics show the variety of the ways that MSAC meets the strategic goals in meeting people's basic needs. In continuing to look at MSAC by the numbers, the biggest number is our budget figure, $740,099. To fully understand this number, one needs to dig a little deeper. It may surprise you to know that just one quarter of this figure, $188,674, comes from the general fund of the city and just about covers staffing costs. The remaining three quarters of our budget, $551,425, comes from investments, grants, fundraising, member fees, program fees, contributions, and senior meal reimbursements. The services that MSAC provides fall into four categories. The first is our Feast Senior Meals Program, which addresses the goals of meeting people's basic needs for food. We've already talked about the number of feast meals produced. I want to highlight the Feast Farm, which you may hear about again in Alex's pre presentation. Uh, it's a program we share with Parks and Trees. This innovative program uses public property to grow food that will feed city residents fresh and nutritious vegetables through the Meals on Wheels program, as well as through the Feast Farm stand. And that um, plot has been relocated up to the Country Club Road property. This is a really cool program, and it's one that the city should be really proud of. Other services that we provide are, as mentioned, classes and programs that keep our seniors in our community active and engaged. Our bright, welcoming ADA and Zoom-enabled facility is also used as a community space for public meetings, clinics, and lectures. MSAC provides many opportunities for volunteer service to folks of all ages. Montpelier High School students volunteer with the FEAST program, as do students from the new school. Adult volunteers are Meals on Wheels drivers, office volunteers, class instructors, kitchen aides, advisory council, and committee members. In preparing for this presentation, we identified four opportunities and four challenges for the Senior Activity Center. The opportunities include 
our established position in the community as a key resource in helping older adults in combating social isolation, which greatly improves their quality of life. The fact that seniors age 50 and up make up 42% of Montpelier's population, giving us a significant population to draw from and to serve. The potential uh, facility at Country Club Road, which could offer MSAC the opportunity for expanded programming is another one of our opportunities. And lastly, the ability to coordinate and expand our programming throughout through our partnership with our fellow community services departments, parks, and recreation. The challenges that we meet are those things that are limiting our ability to take full advantage of the opportunities I just mentioned. Our staffing capacity limits the amount of programming and services that we can offer. I am the only full-time staff member for MSAC specifically. A portion of both Matt and Norma's 40-hour weeks are spent serving the other parts of the community services departments, and POA and Shalanda are both part-time and work just for the FEAST program. Our space capacity is also a challenge in that it limits the amount of programming that we can offer. We are especially short on smaller meeting rooms for discussion groups, tabletop games, and more modest uh, size classes. Parking is the biggest challenge we face at MSAC and the topic that generates the most complaints. In our lot, we have 20 regular parking spaces and three handicap spaces for MSAC. We share the lot with the residents who, um, who live upstairs at 58 Barry Street, and one edge of the lot abuts the parking for the Center for Arts and Learning, who also has parking challenges. Uh, when I worked for the church here in Montpelier, or when I worked for the church in general, there were studies that showed that the size of a church was limited by the availability of parking. And I believe that the same is probably true of a senior center, as its membership is more likely to need to park closer to the pro in proximity to the building. The final challenge is that because we are a municipal entity, we are not eligible to apply for many grants that are available to other senior centers and senior meal programs um, who are designated as 501c3 nonprofit entities. For example, the FEAST program cannot take advantage of more affordable food purchasing through the Vermont Food Bank. And that's just one example of many. It's gonna take some time, uh, some creative thinking too, to meet the challenges that are before us. Uh, yet with new leadership and looking to rebuild our membership after the COVID pandemic, MSAC has begun revitalizing our existing programs and developing new programs as well. We will explore how we can adequately expand our capacity in a fiscally responsible way. We will seek new funding sources, such as major gifts, donor advised funds, and planned giving. For FEAST, uh, we will be working diligently on building revenue streams to offset the rising costs of running a Meals on Wheels program. So thank you again for listening to me tonight. Uh, and do you have any questions? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, my one question, just thinking of the fundraising limitation, have has there ever been exploration of like setting up, for instance, like a 501c3 partner that you could then do fundraising through that's working with the senior center, like whether it was the feast farm, you know, mm -hmm. while maintaining that close relationship with the city, but yeah. has that been done before? It, or the conversations are just starting. Okay. I mean, yeah. It seems like yeah. we're missing out on opportunities. We are. That's exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> so, yeah. So the question is how to make it a partner. And the, our feast program is talking about going full bore into becoming one. And I think there's a lot to talk about there. So, because I think it also needs the city's involvement. So. Anybody else? All right. That was way too easy. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you're supposed to ask me harder questions. <laughs> no, it was a good presentation. Thank you. Come back in December. <laughs> <laughs> but that's when the question is. <laughs> that's when it gets hard, yeah.
Thanks, Evelyn. And thanks, Amy. Um, it's been really great for everyone's information to have Amy on board. Um, really happy to be able to work together with Amy. Um, so I'm going to present about the Parks and Trees Department. My name is Alec Ellsworth. I'm the Parks and Trees Director. Um, I've been working for the city for about 10 years, a little 10 and a half years, and been in this role for um, about four uh, this is our mission to steward Montpelier's parks, trees, and natural spaces for the enjoyment and health of all. Uh, it's a fairly vanilla uh, mission statement, which is fine. Um, but if there's one thing I hope you take away from this presentation tonight, it's that we are not your grandma's parks department uh, or even your mom's parks department. We are um, very, I, I would say, leading edge for Vermont and really the region as far as the programs and uh, projects that we offer. Um, this is our team. Um, we have a staff of four. That's one, two, three, and four. Uh, and then we have two AmeriCorps members uh, who you just saw. Most of these people were here tonight, actually. And then uh, we have a grant-funded feast bar manager, uh, Charlie, there on the bottom, uh, is a full-time year-round position that is not in the city uh, general fund or any other fund. So those are core services. Um, uh, for parks, we have about 500 acres of park, uh, including, you know, most of that is in our two large parks, Hubbard and the North Branch Park. Those those parks have about 30 miles of trails. We maintain year-round, including grooming them for skiing, walking, and other activities in the winter. Um, we also have a number of small parks around town, Blanchard Park behind City Hall here, Mill Pond Park on Elm Street, Summer Street Park in the Meadow, Stonewall Meadows Park, um, the least known park, uh, which is across town in District mm -hmm. 3. Um, and, uh, I don't know the other two I'm forgetting cause of dad brain, but, uh, they're out there, um, <laughs> trees. Um, so we maintain our, our department also maintains all the trees within the city's right of way. Uh, it's, if you're on the double yellow line, it's roughly about 25 feet in either direction. Um, you might ask yourself, why is the parks department in charge of the trees? Um, there are a number of reasons why traditionally, um, you know, in most towns in Vermont, the road crew takes care of the trees. And then in the bigger towns, uh, they'll have a whole tree department with, you know, multiple arborists. And then we like in so many areas, we fall in this in-between zone um, where we have urban infrastructure. We have a, an, an urban forest and, and the maintenance of which requires specialized skills because everything is around roads and cars and, and property. Um, and so... Some years ago, that was shifted away from the DPW and into the Parks Department um, because at, at the time, which was before my time, is at, even before my time here um, when I started, the department just had expertise in that type of work, which is you know particularly specialized. Um, and over time, we've grown that program um, you know to provide a high quality tree program for the city. Um, I'm not really going to focus on the tree program today because uh, that's more in the infrastructure piece. You know, our, our department straddles sort of like this community prosperity and infrastructure goals. Um, the tree program is, you know, we're focused on infrastructure, stormwater benefits, uh, the, so many benefits that trees provide. But I'm not really going to get into that tonight because it's not um, as as uh, germane to this particular strategic goal. But I could do a separate one about that. Um, these are our main pro programs and projects. Um, we uh, um, are uh, one that I'm you know most proud of that I think you've heard about is the MYCC program. Uh, this summer we have about thirty uh, local high schoolers who are going to be working for us for the summer. And so um, one one thing that I I'm proud of about our department is that we are an extremely high leverage department. We have only four staff members, but we're really great at bringing in external funds over the, over the last three or four years, we've, we've brought in over $2 million. And one thing that I like to highlight about that money is sometimes you fall into this trap of you raise money, but then you're required to do extra things or they're for extra programs. Um, but I think we're particularly good at bringing in money um, that we can provide core services with. Um, we take a lot of pride in, in fulfilling that basic mission, you know, that I had earlier, um, and just taking really good care of the facilities that we have. And so so when we have MYCC, we're bringing all these high schoolers in, but they're not doing extra flashy projects 
um, they're a lot of, you know, as you see here, they're like replacing bridges that need to be replaced, um, doing, doing trail work that needs to be done, um, basic maintenance stuff. Um, economic development is the other one that we, um, I think are, um, pushing forward in a way that a, a lot of, um, people don't expect, uh, out of our department. Uh, people don't necessarily think of parks as economic development, but our approach basically boils down to a simple concept, um, which is that there are a lot of towns in Vermont with great trail systems, and there are a lot of towns in Vermont with great downtowns, but there are very few with a great downtown that's seamlessly connected to a great trail system. So if you look on the left there, our, we have a trail that comes directly down behind the state house. Um, and so as we think about um, parks, outdoor recreation, economic development, our focus is on having people start and end their experiences downtown. Um, where the majority of our economic activity is happening. And people are flooding to Vermont for outdoor recreation, and a lot of communities are taking advantage of that. And so we're we are trying to do that. And a, a big part of that for us is a partnership with Montpelier Alive. Um, we have formed a new brand, uh, All Around Adventure. It's in the top left. That's our trail map that you see there. Um, there's a website, adventure.montpelieralive.org. Um, where we have videos about all the different types of things you can do in Montpelier. Um, there's blogs about different types of adventures so that if you're coming here, because Montpelier Alive, really most people, if they're coming to Montpelier, that's their first, you know, the person, they're, they're what they're going to interface with. Um, and so that's been a great partnership for us, the Montpelier Alive partnership, and that continues. Um, we're working on a new set of videos, one for specifically targeted at Quebecers, one about downhill skiing and Montpelier being a hub for going to different downhill skiing areas. So um, we're excited about that work. The other ones I'll just sort of breeze through. Um, oh no, I, I do want to talk about the Feast Farm because that is a, another great program. It's entirely grant funded and it really is born out of this idea of community services in the sense that um, it's a it's a program that's only made possible by our collaboration. Um, the parks department, you know, have, we have certain expertise in equipment and access to land. Um, the senior center, they have a commercial kitchen and people that need food and these meals. The rec department has programming expertise, the ability to um, help with camps and other visitation of that area. So um, that program started in 2020 and it has grown uh it has grown each year um, to the point where now we've been able to fund a full-time farm manager. Um, and it's been a really popular program. I, I would say anybody that has spent time out there um, has really appreciated what that's doing for the community. And the food not only goes to the uh, senior meals program, but also to Just Basics Food Pantry. Uh, it's a partnership with the schools to go to their backpack program um, and through Community Harvest um, to make sure that that food gets used. And even more than the food security issue that that's helping tackle is um, the community resiliency that comes out of that project. People, at, you know, learning about sustainable agriculture, about growing food, people all the way from, you know, middle schoolers who come there to uh, volunteers from the senior center um, and creating, gaining the knowledge and creating those connections between generations that are so important for um, community prosperity. Um, we have seasonal events that people are probably familiar with. Um, some of the things in the bottom right are related to the tree program. We have a tree nursery um, that helps us provide trees affordably for residents. Um, excuse me. We um, use the wood, every, the wood that we use um, is generally um, locked up for firewood and sold. Um, or we're a, we're an emergency heat provider through Capstone. Um, so uh, when people are, you know, in an emergency situation, Capstone can call us and say, you know, deliver a, deliver a quart of wood to, you know, wherever, 20 Town Street, and and we just load it up and deliver it, and Capstone pays us. Um, is that your exact address, Jack? Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's a shot in the dark. I knew the street, but not the number. Well, some of that wood came from our, uh, from 20 Town Street uh, a couple of years ago, so yeah. 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 Um, so I think that's another good way that we're utilizing our resources. And then uh, you all have heard a little bit about Emerald Ash Borer in the past, and and I've showed you sort of the death curve of our ash trees. Um, it's about 10% of our urban forests, and we're right in the steepest part of the death curve uh, right now, right at the bottom of it. So that's an ongoing, an ongoing project. Uh, this is our expenditures of just the Parks Department. Um, 
I can assure you in 2022, there's a revenue line that looks exactly the same as that. Um, so don't be too alarmed by that. We, uh, um, we, like I said, we've been quite successful at uh, bringing in external funds over the last few years. And um, our appropriation has been going down slightly over the last few years because of all the budgetary pressures. Um, and so, you know, that's a challenge and we're certainly not alone uh, with other departments. Um, another thing that I think is a strength of ours is our collaboration with other departments and other entities within the city. Our tree program works extremely closely with the DPW. Um, we, we work really closely with MSAC for the FEAST program. Um, and uh, we, we, our, tree, our tree program also provides services to the school. Um, you know, they pay us for that service, but it's a, another example of like, well, the, you know, we're all in the same boat. And so if we can provide that service to the school at the cost, you know, at the cost of our, um, our employees, as opposed to them, you know, paying much higher rate for a tree to be taken down by a contractor, that's been a nice partnership. We have the same partnership with the cemetery. So, uh, you know, we try to walk a line. We're not trying to take away business from local, local tree contractors, but we're also trying to provide value for entities that are in the public sphere. Um, Oh, we do have a slide about tree management. So this is the tree tree uh, tree management board. So the big jump came in 2020 when we brought on a full time person to uh, manage the tree program. That's our city arborist, um, and that was in anticipation, is both a response to just an increased demand for that service, and then also anticipation for the emerald ash borer um, crisis that was unfolding at that time. And so that's been a great uh, you know great addition to our team and and to the city. Uh, challenges and opportunities. I just put challenges, uh, <laughs> um, funding. I think, you know, we're certainly again, not alone in that we're all feeling the budget pressure. Um, I, if there's one place, you know, where it particularly hurts, I'll put it in number two, which is the CIP capital improvement budget. Um, you've heard that from other departments too, but you know, that kind of deferred spending just stacks up, um, both with equipment and then with also, you know, deferred maintenance of large, um, you know, large facilities and infrastructure. Um, our parks, especially the North Branch Park was hammered by um, the flood in July. So we have a lot of uh, work to do there. And um, for me, that's been an interesting kind of silver lining to the flood because uh, we have so much work that needs to be done over there. Um, but also, you know, as we, as we went, as we learned, FEMA is able to actually pay for our youth to do that work. So in a way, it's it's an amazing opportunity for us to bring a lot of our young people on board to do that work, which has a lot of benefits for them and for the community and and learning about learning those skills and then just um, learning about uh, climate change, resiliency, flood flood recovery. So I'm I'm pleased that we have the opportunity to um, use our NYCC program for flood recovery. Uh, Emerald Ashbor, I mentioned, um, and then, you know, user groups, I think uh, we, you know, finding a balance, threading that needle of um, more and more people wanting to use our parks. Um, and, you know, uh, we're definitely not like the get off my lawn um, kind of parks department. Uh, we take a very inclusive approach and feel like we, we want to make more space for people in our parks. Um, and if people want to use them, there should be a place for everybody. And that creates conflict. Uh, you know, we had a meeting last night where there were a lot more people that, than this in the room about dogs in Hubbard Park. And that's just one example of a place where conflict comes up. Um, and then, yeah, sort of related to that decision making kind of uh, stacks. We have community needs, how things are identified. We have the budget, you know, the power of the purse between you and the voters. Uh, the Parks Commission makes the rules for the park, and then we have advisory groups. So any anytime there's a project, it kind of has to like go through this whole stack, a, a significant project. And uh, we've been able to advance quite a few projects in recent years that um, I think they get a lot of buy-in from going through all these layers. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Alec. That was great. Um, one thing that I should just point out, because you didn't... Uh 
take enough credit for it in the presentation is how incredibly successful the parks department has been at uh, generating outside fundraising and uh, getting donations to add to the uh, to the parks and i think it's been a tremendous uh, benefit to the to the city to uh, add the number of acres you have without to the parks without costing the taxpayers money yeah thank you i appreciate that um there's a I should mention just for your awareness, so you've heard the word, there's a document called the Green Print, um, which is developed by the Parks Commission um, in 2008 and then updated in 2007, uh, 2020, um, which basically lays out a vision for how to expand parks. Uh, so the vision is that everyone is within a 10 minute walk of a high quality park and within a 15 minute walk of a large natural area. Um, and, you know, is exactly germane to this uh, strategic goal. And so when we expand our parks, we try, you know, it's thoughtfully with the green print in mind, um, thinking about how to expand things strategically. We don't just want to, you know, take every opportunity that comes along. And so what the last few that have come along, um, with the Hubbard Park expansion, which was 88, 78 acres, connected a huge neighborhood of over 200 households in the Clarendon Ave neighborhood into, with formal access into Hubbard Park. Um, and then the one in, uh, uh, we added 55 acres to the North Branch Park, which knits together the North Branch Park, the East Montpelier Town Forest, and a conserved sparrow farm property in a way that allows much better trail access. Um, and then the the most underserved area from the green print is a District 3, um, and the, we have a, an 8-acre eight, an eight park um, that is, you know, very valued by the neighborhood up there, but it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not anything close to what uh, some of the other parts of the city have. So we're, we're, we're always looking for opportunities there. There are a number of irons in the fire um, that you're probably aware of too. And so um, increasing our access in district three is something that is definitely top of mind. Thanks. Any questions or comments from council members? All right. <laughs> Thanks. All right, moving right along to development agreement policy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Josh is going to do the the um, prime presentation. As you recall, we discussed this a couple of meetings ago and um, said we'd come back with a, you all agreed to sort of proceed with the concept. So we come back with a draft policy, which is in your packet. And Josh is going to walk through that with you. Yeah, I think... Uh... It was mostly intact when Mike presented it um, last time the, for, for the first time, uh, but the intent is uh, to increase the tools available um, by the municipality to help affect development in the community, um, in large part because of increase in material costs, interest rate environment is just making it that much more expensive for development to happen. Um, and this is a process where we can vet deals. Um, there is there is numbers attached to infrastructure that we can identify um, and a final product and the creation of housing um, that we can match that against um, the cost with that revenue that's generated from that those new housing uh, units. So this policy provides us um, uh, 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 an outline of the process of reviewing potential deals from developers, um, looking at their um, financial cost and comparing that with the revenues of these deals that will be generated in water and sewer fees, uh, connections, and the increase in um, taxes that the city will experience. Um, it, it provides um, guidelines on what we would like to have for payment terms um, regarding, you know, water and sewer infrastructure and roads. Uh, we want to make sure that we're creating a, a deal in terms that we're going to get paid back before everything starts to break down, right? So we need to get roads repaved every 15, 20 years. So we want to get make sure we get our money back within 10 years. Um, so, you know, I think um, 
if we have to also, you know, it's based on us having some money, some capital in advance. We'd love to have a revolving fund that we can just tap into. Um, and we have, you know, smaller funds like the economic development fund that we've, you know, we've helped with capital or uh, Caledonia spirits, you know, but like these larger projects, um, which might require $2 million, $3 million of infrastructure, we might have to go and bond out and go through a, a community-wide vote um, to do this. And, and there's certainly um, a process laid out here to do that, to vet a deal through a loan agreement um, and go through the process of getting a, a bond vote scheduled. The community can decide, and then we can execute a contract with that developer when they have shown us uh, enough guarantee that the development is going to happen um, and we can, you know, use surety um, uh, mechanisms to 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 make sure that the municipality um, is secure, um, so that the taxpayers aren't holding the bag if something bad ha happens uh, in that in that development deal. Um, so, you know, I think this was this was brought up because of uh, an existing project um, that is happening that is ready to go, but needs support um, to help get infrastructure. Um, that is the Isabel Circle um, project, 31 lot subdivision. Um, and they got their active 50 permit last week. So um, I think this is it's a, it's a good opportunity. I think their intention is to develop about 60 to 80 dwelling units up there based on a combination of single family residences, quadplexes and duplexes. Um, they, they do have somebody who is very interested um, in, in purchasing a, a pretty significant number of lots up there. Um, so it is, it is real. Um, and I think, you know, trying to help them make this happen is, is, is really important. Um, to get more people into the community, um, living here and spending money and increasing the tax base. Um, so happy to answer any questions about the the policy here and what your thoughts are. And so the proposal is that we would adopt this uh, as our development agreement policy. Okay. Yes. Tim, looks like you're gearing up. If we do this, really, it just guides an agreement that you'd ultimately be crafting with each developer specifically for each project. Yeah, and that was the next question. We're not passing right. this down. No, this is just a this is a policy that we can then say to a developer, "This is our policy. This is kind of what you got to meet." Then we work out specifics, come back, and figure out you know what we're willing to do and how the thing costs out and all those kinds of things so as a matter of course you could just do a development agreement with a developer now and we could approve it and you don't need a policy or well actually, need the policy well so this has come up a couple of times actually we we feel yeah. we do need a policy not not necessarily for this particular project mm -hmm. but i think some of our staff you know i think everyone's juggling a lot and so you know having some criteria about which projects qualify for this and which ones don't and, you know, what we will do and what we won't do is I just think helpful because, mm -hmm. you know, do we do it sure. for, do we do it for someone who was putting three, you know, a, a three unit subdivision that, you know, if they, I mean, here we're saying it's geared up for the guys at least 10 units, you know, whatever. So we talk about those kind of needs. So um, we think it's important. It doesn't mean we couldn't do this one without it, but it, it kind of, it says, we will do these. Here's kind of the rules of the game. Yep. Yep. Um, and it, it helps provides us, us a framework because, yep. like Bill said, there is multiple city departments, staff who are going to be working on this. So it provides all of us a framework that we're working with um, to assess these deals um, at the same time. Yeah. And it takes away a little bit of um, are we working on all of this? And then the council won't actually be interested in this. You know, we kind of came and say, look, there's a council policy. We followed the policy. This is eligible. Here you go. You know, and then it's, you know, and the council can always change your policy or take it away. But mm -hmm. as long as it exists, then it's clear this is something we can do. Yeah. And I think if it helps us on the city side to get all the departments together and the people together, because from an entity coming in to deal with the city, 
I'm sure it's challenging right? because you keep getting different people from different departments coming at you when you're really mm-hmm. trying to get a project on the tracks and growling. Yeah. So if this helps you to do that, I think that's important too. Well, and as you mentioned, you know, there obviously there are a lot of regulations and things someone has to go through. So they're getting that, but you know, when we can say, however, you know, here's a way we can help you and, and make this work as long as, you know, as long, again, only to the extent that they're going to generate the revenues to cover our cost. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not going to, we're not going to give them, well, we're not going to give them money, but the money will go into the public infrastructure, but it would be to make sure that that worked. And yep. uh, obviously every project will have a huge amount of details to be worked out and those, then you would see those. Yeah. So I, I really like the idea of, of um, you know, the city encouraging through um, infrastructure and, and other means, um, giving developers the help they need to get started. I'm a little curious what, I mean, I know it's going to, you were saying that when, the, when an actual deal comes up, there's a lot of details, but I'm just curious what happens when, when the uh, conditions are not met when the development fails or lags behind or takes twice as long, you know, when, when these goals like uh, road pavement uh, repayment and infrastructure repayment, when they're not met, what, what sort of things are built into these agreements for the city's protection? Yeah. Areas? So, so you're, are you respect, specifically referencing like we enter into a development agreement with a, a developer property owner uh, goes to say it goes needs to go to bonding. It's it's approved and then the project starts and then it starts to not meet expectations. Is that what you're? That's what I'm, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, in the case of like if it needs to go to a bond vote, then I think we would look to have security with a surety bond, so that there is a a, a third entity who is securing that agreement, that contractual obligation between the city and the developer so that we are secure, the voters are secure, taxpayers are secure. Um, and what might trigger the call on that sh- uh, surety bond? Um, I think that it it depends on the deal itself. It would be the terms. Of the- it would be the terms in the contract. Um, so it might, you know, in a subdivision, we're looking at lots. We're talking about number of dwelling units to be created over a period of time, knowing that we need to get repaid back in a certain time frame, right? So we would be expecting a certain number of lots, units to be uh, developed over uh, a set period of time. So that would be the, the, the trigger and the timeline. We would keep monitoring that. Mm-hmm. And certainly probably built in there would be, you know, you didn't, you only did 13 dwelling units in this time period and you're supposed to do 15, right? So like, there may be a trigger for us to sort of say, hey, what are you going to do to make up for this? Time to sit down and, yeah. How does this affect your workload, um, do you think? Well, um, I I don't expect to have these, like, often, right? <laughs> it would be a nice <laughs> problem to have. It would be but a great it's, problem it's to have. An ongoing monitoring relationship. Um, yes. And I would expect that, I mean, these, these will be large projects um, for the most part, I, w- I would expect. Yeah. Um, and so it does um, help to create a relationship early on. And so I think I think it could be a smooth transition. And certainly they're going to be creating the documents that are needed. And so just having a, a real collaborative sort of approach to it between city departments and the developer to make it as seamless as possible I think that'll that'll help things, um, and so I'm not I'm not afraid about my time because I think you know it'd be great to have one a year, but um, let's see what happens. I just wanted to put in here too. I we got a couple excellent suggestions from uh, Councilmember Hurl the other day about this, and we've spent a fair amount of time. So I do want to put out two two questions that are on the table. One is in the in the event that we actually had multiple of these, you know, sort of coming in at once, what what would we do? You know, how would we prioritize them? And I think that is something that needs further thought. It isn't specifically addressed in this. And and I think our suggestions, you know, we will come back to later with that. And that would be a great problem to have. I think a, a, a more cogent question is, um, you know, we should create, and, and I don't think we need to right now, but again, we'll, we, we'll, we'll, I think we'll try to come back in July with something, some sort of financial cap. At what point do we say, 
like we, we're at the risk, you know, we were, we will no more than $10 million in bonding or $20 million would be used for these development agreements, even though they're coming back at some point, you know, there is a slight risk to them. You know, what number are we comfortable with saying, you know, that's, that's as far as we would go with the, you know, and obviously it would be a poli council policy. So, you know, you could give yourself the ability to override it if there was a, you know, huge compelling project that, you know, made sense, but it would basically be, be a guideline so that, you know, say we maxed it out, we could tell someone, look, you know, we can't take you for two years um, because, you know, and again, that, that would be good news because we, we would have allocated all that bonding then we would have all these projects going. So, um, you know, it would be a good project to have. But so I, our suggestion is we go ahead with this now so we can proceed with the one in hand, but that our commitment to you is that we will come back with recommendations on those two criteria because they were excellent questions. And they worth considering. Anything else? Barry. Yes, that then will we approve the development agreement policy as presented? Thank you. Is there a second? Also. Okay. Any more discussion? Uh, Lauren. Yeah. Um, and thanks, Bill, for raising those questions. I mean, I, I really like this idea and I love like us putting all kinds of ways that we can try to help spur housing development. So thanks for developing this. And I think the criteria look great. Um, I, I do think like for me, I would want to be hitting benchmarks of, you know, certain, certain type of affordability of the housing or like these are public good projects if we're putting taxpayer money into it. So like those criteria that we can come back with are really important to me that this is like a good use of what we're asking our taxpayers to fund like you know five million dollar houses i'm not interested in helping pay for the road for but like <laughs> we would want i'd want to be clear both for to help give us guidance and for developers to know like some expectation of if is there a project the type of project and could our criteria help encourage you know like that isabel circle project evolved from a lot of units multifamily, like a great thing and it got whittled down you know for a variety of reasons and you know is there a way that this support could help push it back in that direction, you know, like because we're taking some of the funding or helping affordability of those homes by taking these costs. So anyway, I just like that's a lens that I would want to be bringing to it. So glad to hear that we'd have some information coming back. And I think just the financial piece, too, is really important to make sure we have some sense of what would we be willing to do and I, I hope we have the problem that <laughs> we have a lot of projects to to run this through. But yeah. um, but yeah, thanks again. This is this is exciting to see something tangible we can do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just to follow Lauren's thoughts, I, I do think we need to keep an open mind on the filter of affordable housing versus creating housing. I don't we haven't had any litmus test to show any five million dollar homes built in Montpelier or so. But but I do think new housing is the most expensive housing. I mean, the cost per unit. And sometimes if you look at the way it really works in the world, if you can create housing for maybe someone next step or two up, you might free up some less expensive housing for someone. And I think we've got to remember that because we keep building the most expensive units for, for the starter side. Um, and it really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, some of it's okay, but we're not balancing. And the other piece having developed through a few cycles is, is – we all live through them is I remember 2007, eight and nine very well. I was developing a project then. And when the market stops, it just, it can stop. And so when we set up timelines and, and penalties, um, there will be factors that a developer cannot control. And uh, hopefully it doesn't happen during the course of our projects, but um, you have to keep that in mind because yep. it's happened before. Absolutely. And you can survive them, but you've got to do it cooperatively. Yep. Yep. And of course, all that gets worked out in the context of any particular project and application. Anybody else? Or are we ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? All right. Great. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Man, we are zooming right along. We ordinarily take a break at 8.30, but I think I suggest, unless people are dying to do what we power through. Okay. Summer schedule. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor.
So typically, uh, we about this time of year, we look at our summer schedule and have tried to drop at least one meeting in the summer, just because many of you have summer plans, staff has summer plans, people aren't as engaged with the city government during the summer. And I you know, took a look at what we have on our plate and gave some thought to you folks who have had more than your share of meetings this year. And so I'm actually suggesting that we drop uh, the first meeting in both July and August and just hold a meeting on July 24 and a meeting on August 28. So those would be regular council nights, the second Wednesday of the month. Uh, and I think we can manage that. We might have a busy September meeting, but it might be worth it. And then with the caveat, and I know experienced members know this, we might occasionally need to call a, a Zoom meeting, uh, an, an all remote meeting for a consent agenda or a contract approval, or, you know, I think usually around in there is we set the tax rate and that's a sometimes a quick five minute meeting. So we, you know, those may happen, but they're less intrusive. You don't need to cancel your vacation. As long as we have four of you, we can get them done. But as long as you're willing to understand that those may come up, uh, we we think that uh, we can, and it's actually great for staff too, because it gives us a chance to get caught up in some of the work without having, you know, prepping these things. We will have just adopted the strategic plan. Hopefully, um, you know, we'll be in a good place. So that's our suggestion. Obviously, you're welcome to meet more often and add those two meetings back. Um, but Well, I think you all have heard me say I, I miss it when we skip too many meetings, but but, but I recognize I may not be the majority here. It seems like a fine idea to me. <laughs> you're, you're welcome to attend by yourself. Yeah. We, we'll keep meeting. We'll keep meeting and we'll have, uh, we can go on, on Zoom for that. Yep. Um, any, anyone else think that makes sense? Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. Need a motion for this? Yeah. So I'll move that we schedule regular council meetings for July 24th and August 28th and cancel the regular council meetings uh, for July 10th and August 14th. All right. Just because scheduling can never be that easy, but I, so I know I have a conflict July 24th. That is a five Wednesday month. I was wondering if July 17th worked for people. I love this idea of monthly meetings and some other business, but I don't know if that, that day works. It's, it's not our usual scheduled meeting week or, or the other July meeting, even that's the one July Wednesday I can't make. And then that just means like two whole months. I won't, mm -hmm. <laughs> but don't, yeah, you don't have to schedule around me. Carrie. Yeah. I it's on that on the 24th as well. I don't know yet, but there's a, a work thing. The 17th work so I think the 17th would be fine. Mm -hmm. Seventeenth, okay with everybody else. So this motion is dying for lack of a second. No, I'm not going to let that happen, Josh. Really? Well, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So who wants to second it? Why don't you just let it die? Let it die. Let it die. All right. Let's let it die and make a new motion. <laughs> so the new motion is. Um, to schedule regular council meetings for July 17th and August 28th and cancel the regular council meetings for July 10th and August 14th. And July 24th. And July 24th. <laughs> and who's going to second that? Any more discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. City Council reports. Adrian's in this time. Okay. Sal. Oh, uh, no. Tim. Our retrievers good? Last week. Thank you all for that. I think the um, Housing Committee met last night. And they have a lot, there's a lot of work before the, that committee right now. Um, and I think we're going to need to support them as, as it comes about. Josh has been great as a support person. Um, I think we just approved a member for a new committee tonight. So we may lose another housing committee member. And um, 
we just really have to watch this one because there's a lot of weight there right now. The chair's just resigned and uh, mm -hmm. it's an important committee for us. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, Palin? Uh, no report, thank you. Lauren? Uh, only thing for me, um, just have been following a lot of the legislative activity closely. Bill might have reports. I just happened to run into Maggie, our lobbyist, on my walk tonight over, and I was like, how are we on our funding things? And she confirmed the three and a half million for elevating homes is still in the budget. It still looks solid. They are hopefully getting out Friday, so there's not that much more time for it to go awry. Um, and there was also a $5 million, I believe it's statewide, but for businesses impacted by flooding. So that got kind of added later. It's on a contingency list, so there's some chance it won't get funded, but it looks kind of hopeful right now. So that was money that hadn't been there a couple weeks ago. So that was good. Um, there's also a number of other policies that are moving forward. There was a bill today that um, is now off to the governor that looks at um, watershed management and trying to reduce flood risk through a statewide statewide programs around wetlands and river corridors and things. So I'm in part thinking, I know we often like invite our legislative delegation it, I mean, it's been it's been a rough one. So maybe we give them a couple weeks, but <laughs> at one of our upcoming meetings, you know, and then a lot of stuff's going to get vetoed and there's going to be a veto session. So I don't know the right timing exactly, but it would be great to invite them in to hear about um, kind of what happened and what might have passed that we missed that is relevant to the city. Look at our um, policy agenda that we'd put in and see where we landed on stuff. Thanks. Uh, with regard to that, do you know, uh, I, I had a call about S310 saying that it might be worth uh, I'm going to place a call to one of one of the senators who uh, apparently needs to be heard from or needs to hear from us. So that's where the uh, elevation money is coming from, is in, I think. Yes, although I it sounds like people aren't worried that that's going to it's in the budget. So even if there's issues with that bill, even though they are kind of linked, that the money should still be there. But but I think a call in to I'll try to, I think, yeah. I think getting calls in to support that bill would still be good. That's 310. Um, Senator Ruth Hardy. All right. Um, and that is that That's it. all you have? Okay, great. Um, a couple of things for the mayor's report. One, uh, I will reiter reiterate what uh, uh, Councillor Hurl said earlier tonight, which is that the next public forum of the Recovery and Resiliency Commission is May 23rd. And uh, since it's right after our next meeting, um, get the get the word out now so that um, people are thinking about attending uh, every one of these. There's been a tremendous amount of uh, public participation, which I think has been, uh, has been great. Also, the other night I had a, a meeting with a number of local uh, business uh, owners about uh, how things are going downtown and how some of their what some of their concerns are and um, it was they had a bunch of questions so I could answer some of those questions and I'll probably be able to answer more of them after I uh, sit down with uh, with Bill and I invited them to uh, to come to our next uh, council meeting so we'll put a slot on the agenda for them to come and talk about what the what their thoughts are and what uh, they have going on. As Tim said, one of the issues is that people are thinking it's kind of looking kind of grimy downtown. And I don't think it looks any worse in downtown Montpelier than it is in downtown Barry, where I was just in court the other day. We don't want to look, th that's right. Um, and I know that the Department of Public Works is doing a lot, but it seems like one of the issues is that the uh, the dust and the uh, grime from the plowing and the flooding is like caked and hardened. So sweeping may not be enough to uh, to deal with it. And people were also saying, well, you know, the the outside of the buildings downtown are also dusty and dirty and. Uh, I don't know if the city has a way to deal with that. It's pr probably having the fire to, fire trucks go down and spray the outside of those buildings. I, I can see some concerns about doing that. Exactly, yeah. But, um, but we're going to continue to uh, 
keep open that dialogue and uh and i think it's a good thing to do I'll, i they're gonna have something organized for for next time so that they're not just it's just not just an onslaught of 10 people telling everything that, that's in their in their minds um and I also just wanted to mention, as I was leaving my office the other day, um, I went by a couple of people walking their dogs and they dog and they recognized me. And they said, hey, they were really glad to see the uh, work being done on the railroad crossing uh, downtown. And they said, I really want to make a commendation for the police department, the fire department and the road crew. Those guys are the best. And. People hear a lot of complaints. It's good for them to hear the positive comments too. And that's what I have. City clerk. Oh, I just note that we did, for all you folks working on the abatements for so much, we did put in for the, uh, to get the education tax portion of those abatements covered. And we did get, we are getting all that covered. That got accepted. Um, might as well, it's a little early, but just to put on your calendars again, we are going to have another board of abatement meeting on June 4th. It's a Tuesday and it's a really quirk of our charter that we have to have one. Then. Um, but there's plenty to do on it. We've got seven or eight, actually, I think eight hearings, all but one are flood related. So now that we've got that down to a science, I'm sure we can fly through them. Um, the one that's not flood related is related to the the fire up here at RK Miles, I guess. Um, so, anyways, that put that on your calendar. It's coming up, and that's all I got. And city manager, um, I don't have a whole lot either that we haven't already covered. I would say a uh, one item. I thought I'd mention this. We, you know, uh, we. We have our parklet program, and you recall that during COVID, we put in some you know emergency rules that made things a little easier for people. Um, and then last year, at the beginning of the year, we we or maybe whatever it was, end of twenty two four twenty three, we put back sort of the, the permanent rules, and that's great. We did get a request this year. You know, we have three parklets that if if it would it be possible to just waive their fees for this one year, just because you know it's not a huge amount. I mean, it's a few hundred dollars, but it's something that you know, to help in flood recovery. So it would require either a temporary ordinance or amendment. Or, so I was planning to put it on the next agenda, but I thought I'd just look around the table for head nods before I did that. So uh, it would be a one time this summer thing. Uh, it's not a giant sum of money. The, the fee, if anyone remembers, and I can calculate the exact amount for you, is basically the same as if someone parked at the parking spot the whole time and paid the meter. So it's just the, the cost of the meter. What, I just would want to make sure there's clear criteria for who is getting that waiver, other than then they were the ones who happened to ask. Uh, there's only three parklets right now. So it would right? be for all and of them. They, it would be for all the, any, it would be anyone in the flood. Well, that's the only place you can put the parklets. So, yeah, I mean, they're all flood impacted. So, yes, yeah, so it would be all parklets this year. So if anyone came, they would also, but I, I think, the, or we could decide whether it's only the returning ones, if somebody's putting a new one out. It just seems like, they need all the business they can get. If they can get outside seating, that's great. And if we can save them a few hundred bucks one year, it's a nice, it's not, a, it's kind of like the the thing we did earlier tonight. It's not a budget breaker, but it's a nice gesture to just support downtown. So it'll be, yeah, sounds great. Yeah. So it'll be, like I said, because it's the fee is set in ordinance, you'll need to do some kind of voodoo to, to, Make it go away this summer, but put it on the consent agenda. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's what part. Of, well, it's an ordinance, so probably every first reading. Hmm. But it can be a short one. Could it be a waiver instead of it? Well, well, we can talk about there's it. No, but there's is no. Well, no, we'll take okay. I don't think there is a waiver position. If there right. was, that would have been the way to go. Maybe we should put that in and then leave it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but anyway, there's that. I uh, just wanted to say that our applications for fire chief closed on Friday. We had 14 applicants. We've got a group of people uh, working on that. We met Tuesday and um, identified six that we thought we wanted to look into a little bit more. We're meeting again tomorrow. We've had you know, a few days to Google them all individually and read the resumes a little more closely and look at you know 
So we'll get together again tomorrow to see uh, if all six or some subset of them move forward. Um, it'll be an interesting process. We've got you know three folks from the fire union, the deputy chief, the police chief, Kelly, Tanya, the HR director, and myself. And uh, um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, to, to more to come on that. Great. And that's all I have. All right. And at 8.45 8 8 p.m., we are adjourned. Wow. <laughs>